Okay, so welcome to part two. <laughs> um, so we've now derived the conditions on, uh, we've basically proved the existence of a generating function and proved also that if the generating function is known, then you can have a valid canonical transformation. In some sense, the generating function actually generates the transformation but I haven't told you how to find it yet, okay? And then I said the aim is ultimately to get a transformation where you can simply label the or the, a particular orbit with its coordinates and have the other side, or have its sort of, no, sorry, label a particular orbit with its momenta and have the coordinates cyclic and ignorable. And um, the way, the thing that I then said is, we want to find an F that does that, and we want this condition, and we also can observe that the F is the relationship between basically Q and P, and if you have it, sorry, Q and new momenta, original coordinates, new momenta, and if you have it, then you can, in terms of that new function, you can write the old momenta as well. And then I said, well, the most obvious thing to do is to stick that definition into your Hamiltonian, and then you get this thing called uh, the Hamilton-Jacobi equations, and if you can solve it, and that's a big if, um, then you can get this generating function that will actually then take you to the Hamiltonian you want and generate the coordinate system. And so if you actually go to Goldstein, I think it's chapter 10, um, they discuss this Hamilton-Jacobi equation more generally, and then they have a comment as to how you actually solve this partial differential <coughs> equation, and they say, in practice, only if you can solve the partial differential equation by separation of variables uh, has it been useful, right? In other words, you have the general theory, you have a mechanism of working and then you have the actual application. Um, and most of the times that the hamilton Kobe equation has been used is you actually analytically solve this partial differential equation. And so it turns out for the Kerr metric, it is difficult but possible. And so that's what I'm going to do now. But I'm not going to go straight to the Kerr metric. I'm going to do it systematically like I simplified the problem for full GR and then SAVGR and then Kerr because there's a lot of potential research between Kerr and full GR that people have not touched. So let's, let's basically do that. Okay, so that's just the reference. So let's have a look. Let's start with a full um, Hamiltonian in GR. There we go, we have four momenta and four coordinates. The Hamiltonian Jacobi equations is simply you, instead of your momenta, you push, D, you substitute dw dqi, where w is now the Hamilton Jacobi function. Okay, and um, you then have um, this thing equals to, you know that the Hamiltonian is conserved and therefore H is a constant, and that constant in Goldstein, they call it alpha one, okay? So this, that notation you can actually match with Goldstein's notation, that's why I put in the W. Um, in GR, we often call the alpha one minus half mu squared, okay? So that's just the context, but I wanted, I want to have the, the map of the two notations because it simply facilitates bringing the knowledge about Hamiltonian systems to be applicable on GR. Now, you can specialize further, and we most probably will never go past this specialization unless, I don't know, maybe never say never. Um, so the Hamilton-Jacobi for the SAV metric, okay, remember for that case, you have the specialization, and this is the upper metrics, so I've just written down the upper components, you have basically, it's diagonal in two coordinates. I think I've made a mess. And um, it's got a block system over here. Sorry, this should be ZZ. Okay, so the previous 
The first lecture I had used rho and z, and in this lecture I simply switched to rho and r and theta simply to get to curve, but they are just variables, so you could actually call them anything you want. You must just be consistent, and therefore that should be theta, theta. Okay, so sorry about that. Okay, so this is the most general SAV metric where these functions are fixed by the field equations, which we will maybe not, yeah, we'll, we won't derive them just yet. Okay, so the first thing is let's us look at the t and phi coordinates. So we're now going to say we want a general transformation from these boyle lindquist coordinates to a new set of coordinates, okay? But, and we want the new set of coordinates to basically label the orbits, but there's no reason to transform the t and phi coordinates because they're ignorable anyway, okay? So we're basically going to keep the ignorable coordinates unchanged, and what that means is that PT, the new coordinates, the new momenta associated with the new coordinates must be the same as the old one. So we have PT, the new momenta is equals to the old momenta, and we call this minus E, okay? And therefore, DW, DT is simply um, a PT, okay? So that's the one equation we've got. And we've got... Um, uh, P phi is equals to the old momenta is equals to LZ. So DW, D phi is also a constant. We're going to call that constant LZ. Okay, so if we, you did the partial differential equations course with me, what can this first statement tell you about W? Right? This first statement says W, which is a function of the old coordinates and the new momenta, is not a function of T. Okay, so basically W is simply E times, okay, so you integrate this thing out, so it's E times T plus an arbitrary function of everything that's not there. So plus an arbitrary function of T, of not, sorry, an arbitrary function of R, theta, and phi. Okay, that's the most general statement that you get. Okay. And then you take that solution and you differentiate it with respect to phi, and then you get that dw d phi is a constant, and therefore that previous arbitrary function is no longer an arbitrary function of r, theta, and phi, but rather has a form that looks like this. Okay, so w you can write as um, minus et plus lz phi, plus an arbitrary function of r and theta, okay? And you can go on and you can check, verify, that dw dt is simply minus e and dw d phi is lz, okay? And that is the most general w that obeys the two conditions. Okay, so far so good. Okay, so we've now got a transformation that keeps t and phi unchanged and we still have to deal with this guy. Okay, so now let's write out the Hamilton-Jacobi equations. So for the SAV metrics, so we're going to have that it is 2 alpha 1, so I basically are going to take this 2 and multiply alpha 1 because I don't want to carry a half with me, and then simply GRR D, um, w, and this is the small w, dr squared, and um, g theta theta dw d theta squared and lz squared times g phi phi. So I'm simply replacing the new momenta, um, or oh sorry, that I already know for w. This is simply dw d phi times g phi phi um, times g phi t dw d. Um, E, sorry, dw dt, dw d phi, okay, and there are two things, so that's where the two comes in, plus e squared gtt, okay, so that's our Hamilton Jacobi equation, and remember all these g's are functions only of r and theta, okay, 
So for the general SAV metric, if you can solve that equation, then you've solved the Hamilton-Jacobi equation and you at least can say something about the transformation to the coordinates that actually are constant along your orbits and you can label the orbits. And if you have make that Poincaré map, then you're going to have a closed curve. So you can check numerically that you can solve it. You can so if you can solve it, you can actually get the exact transformation and you can compute what the curve is like. Okay. A two date... I think there are four space times that have actually this thing has been solved for. Four SAV space times that the thing has been solved for. The first one was done by Carter. And then there's a whole bunch of four others that you can basically solve using this method. And I've actually listed them in, there's a paper that I'll also put up, where I actually derived them a different way and um, listed them, okay. So the Kerr is one of them, and I'm actually going to, I'm gonna do that now, okay. So this, we now want to, one method of getting the constant is solving this equation for W, and so what we basically have here is a nonlinear PDE in two independent variables, okay, and so, Let's specialize and do it for Kerr because this is the one where it was solved first. So just a reminder, you have the Kerr black hole, okay? You have the metric that I'm going to write in boyer lindquist coordinates. This is not the coordinates in which it was solved for the first time, okay? It is a set of coordinates that are, make it easier to do subsequently, okay? And it's also a set of coordinates that most of the field actually works in. Okay, and it's also the set of coordinates in which the paper of, that I did with Marissa was written in. So that's why I'm doing it this way, so that there's a correct connection between what was done there and the Toshe I'm using. Okay, so the parameters, A is the spin of the black hole, okay. M is the mass of the black hole, they're just constants. I like to keep M in when I do calculations, but when I make it numerically, I just put M equals to 1. Okay, um, A, if A is equals to zero, you can get the Schwarzschild metric. So for your first try, basically everything I say today will be true, just put A equals to zero into any, any result. Okay, so that will actually help you integrate the things. And so what the curve, if you actually write out the curve metric, you have these two functions that people have just labeled for convenience. Um, delta is just a function of R, and sigma is a function of R and cos squared theta. Sorry, R squared and cos squared theta. And those two play a role. So you can see over here, if you have um, A equals to zero, you just have R squared minus 2MR. And if you've been working with a Schwarzschild radius, sometimes they have RS, which is a Schwarzschild radius, and that's 2M often. Okay. Um, and so this is the Kerr metric in all its gory and frightening detail. Um, it eventually, once you get to know it, it's not so scary, right? But, right, this is the one in the boyer lindquist coordinates. So what I'm going to do now is remember you had to take this metric and you had to work out the inverse to get the upper metric that goes into the Hamiltonian. Okay, and that takes some doing to get the inverse, and then secondly, it takes some more doing to get it nice. Um, so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the Hamilton Jacobi equation where I've made the inverse nice, and I strongly advise you to do it yourself. Actually, work out the inverse. Do the simplifications and the multiplying out that you can write it in this way, and at least. Even if you don't do it directly, prove that the two are the same, right? So convince yourself that it is done. And because you're most probably going to use it again and again if you use it later on, you're quite welcome to write that calculation up and put it in the, one of the appendixes of your thesis. Okay, so it's, it's useful enough that you can actually, like, keep it, right? So 
do that. So here is the Hamilton Jacobi equation. So it's a two alpha. Then you have the first couple are easy. So the inverse of sigma over delta here is just one over that. So there we go. The coefficient in front of dw d theta squared is just one over this. And here is the tricky part. Okay, the inverse of this part, so this bottom part over here, where these things are the inverse metric, you can write like this. Okay, so this is what I actually want you to go about and do, is verify that this thing is actually true. Okay, and so if you look at it carefully, you have LZ minus EA sine theta squared, and you have a squared over there, right? So instead of actually writing the square out, I've taken this thing and I've combined it into two complete squares that I subtract from each other, okay? And I think Carter did this too, right? And um, so I'm just gonna leave it there. So have a look at these things, okay? So at the bottom, and have a look at what the coordinates are involved. At the bottom, I have sigma that is messy because it has both r and theta in it. Okay, so I have a thing over here, but up top here, I only have things that have to do with sine theta. Okay, and up on top of this bracket, I only have a thing that has to do with r, and this delta only has to do with r. So I basically have one over sigma multiplying the sum of two functions that are functions only of the one variable. Okay, and that's the reason for aiming to write it like this. Okay, so definitely go and do this, all right? You'll find it useful, um, and simply verify that you can write this way, okay? And then just one thing later on, I'm going to actually set alpha equals to minus a half mu squared, and before, okay, so then I'm now totally going to go into GR world, now that all my constants are the ones I'm comfortable with, and I want to talk about how this equation was actually solved, okay, and how in the solution you actually see the constant arising, okay, the new moment arising that actually describes the curve and what it actually is. So the story about this is the Kerr metric, it was first made, found by Kerr, this is a southern hemisphere story. So Kerr was a New Zealander, um, and um, Roy Kerr, very robust guy, and he found the Kerr metric in 1963, okay? Remember Swatchfield was found in 1916 on the Second World War's trenches, literally, sorry, First World War's trenches, Kerr came along in 1963 and found another solution, only after people had actually interpreted what Swatchell's solution was. Okay, if you're a physicist, you care about things, but it has units of kilograms squared, meters to the fourth seconds to the minus two. Okay, these, and the thing, the guy who found the constant and integrated those hamilton jacobi equations was um, a guy called Brandon Carter, also a Southern Hemisphere guy, was an Australian. Um, he went from Australia to his PhD in Cambridge under a guy, a pretty much an unsung hero, both of partial differential equations and geometry and relativity, a guy named Dennis Schiama. Very quiet, very effacing, never liked playing the public, um, like, professorial politics. But he was the mentor to Brandon Carter. He was also the mentor to Stephen Hawking. If you know, if you've ever watched the video on Hawking, there's this advisor, like the quiet one, that helped Hawking. It was Dennis Kiyama. Um, a whole bunch of other people in our field comes from doing that. He's in the applied math. So in Cambridge, relativity is in the applied math department. Damned is the thing. Anyway, so his advisor was Dennis Kiyama. He was very, very good at developing young students. Okay, and uh, Brandon Carter did this thing late in his life. I think he's passed away last year or something. He spent most of his life working in uh, CNRS. It's an institute in 
France, I think. Uh, I saw him at some conferences, very, very nice, very proper, old school, nice guy. Um, anyway, so what he did is he integrated those equations for Kerr for the first time for separation variables. That bracketing of the way he wrote it that way, um, that's due to him. You can actually see it in his original paper. And the paper, I actually put up the original paper. He, he actually did it more generally than just for Kerr, um, but you're welcome to read it. In fact, some of the equations that we get, you'll actually recognize, like equation 48 and so, you'll actually see that we're using it. But I'm taking out just what we need. So this is the paper. I've actually put the link for it on the website if you're curious what the historic first paper was like. Okay, so let's now see what he did. So he said, there's our Kerr metric. Okay, and what I, he worked in this, as I said, he worked in slightly different coordinates. Um, but I'm going to stick to Boyle and Quist coordinates because what he did is exactly the same and you can actually see the things go between each other. So here are hamilton jacobi equations. And the thing is, it's a PDE, nonlinear, first order, push the solve button. Okay, and you two might be able to push the solve button. Otherwise, we can discuss it after class. Um, so what he did is he said, let me take, you can see I've already rewritten it a bit. I took that thing in the denominator that was messy, that had both r and theta in it, and I rewrote the equation. Mainly, if you multiply with something, make sure it's non-zero, and this is good because it's always non-zero. Okay, so I multiplied through by the sigma, and then what he observed is, I now have this PDE. Derivative of W, which is a function of, w, of R and theta. This thing is only a function of R. This thing is only a function of theta. Then I have one bracket that is a function only of theta. And the second thing, which is a function only of R. Okay. So then he did the classical separation of variables. Let's collect terms dependent of R and theta respectively. So I'm going to move everything with respect to R to the one side. And I'm going to move everything else with respect to theta to the other side. OK. Now, most of the time, when in my class, when you did separation of variables, you said, let W be the product of two things. Okay, that was our ansatz. But you could equally have said, let me make a separation ansatz, and here it comes. And let me say that let W be a function of R and theta, and the, un the separation ansatz is simply the sum of two independent functions. Okay, so I'm going to let W be equals to the sum of these two, and then if I do that, right, this part falls away if I take the derivative with respect to R, and the R part falls away here if I take the derivative with respect to theta. So then I truly have that everything on the left-hand side is a function only of R. Everything on the right-hand side is a function only of theta. And, the only, and because they're completely independent variables, the only way that that can be true if they are, if each side is independently equals to a constant. And, okay, so they must be equals to a constant, and the functions W of R, of R only, and W of theta, of theta only, must obey these equations. So what I have then done is I've introduced a new constant, which you are going to see is going to be my new momentum. Okay, and so you can now see how I went from the hamilton jacobi equations that prescribed only the derivatives with respect to theta and r and didn't say anything about the new momenta to actually getting a logical new thing, which I can call a constant into a new momentum variable which is a separation constant, but it introduced, it, it introduced itself naturally in solving the PDE. Okay, so the thing is, if I solve these two, um, 
then, and I combine the solution, then I actually have a valid solution to my Hamilton Jacobi equations. So, separation, so the summary is separation of variables, it's an ansatz, uh, introduces this integration constant. And let's examine it a little bit more closely. So, let me now say, let this constant k be the new variable. In other words, let me have k, which is a function of the old coordinates and the old momenta, and in this case, simply theta and p theta, because it's independent of r, okay? And I'm going to b set it equals to this. And now what I want you to do, okay, so, so that's the one thing. So this is k, and you can actually see this in Carter's original paper. He also calls it a curly k. But I don't call it a curly k because I've restricted my curly k's to, Hamilt to Hamiltonian functions, which it turns out if you go deep into the theory, it actually is as well. But we just keep it there. Anyway, so this is the new k, um, or a new momentum, and that's it. Now, just to be a bit, make connection with other stuff, if you look at the paper that I did with Marissa, or if you look up the Carter constant on Wikipedia, what you're going to get is something like that. Okay. And, okay, that's not a typo. That is a valid constant as well. So now, as an exercise, go work out the Poisson brackets of K with a Kerr Hamiltonian. In other words, this K. In other words, K of R theta, P theta, um, PR, and then all the others are basically T phi, um, PT, P phi. You can assume K to be that, and work out this, actually work out this commutator, because it's useful, basically as an exercise of your Poisson bracket. But it should also illustrate to you that this thing commutes with H and is zero. Okay? Entirely equivalent, you could just take, work out DD tau of K. In other words, you get 2P theta, theta dot, and the derivatives of this whole thing with respect to theta times theta dot, and you should see that it is zero. Okay. So you now have a constant that remains, this k remains constant along the trajectories. Um, and it was obtained by this thing, by the separation constant, because Carter understood the theory. What is interesting is, look at how long it took, right? You had field equations. People already understood what the geodesic equations meant. They'd solved them for Schwarzschild. But it took at least five years before they could actually integrate the geodesics in Kerr. And it was only Carter, when Carter actually managed to write it in a way we could actually solve the Hamilton-Jacobi variables, the Hamilton-Jacobi equations where it was discovered for the first time. And that little constant is what took the geodesics in Kerr from a sp system that you integrate numerically to a system you could actually analyze analytically and get a whole bunch of results out. And that's looking at those equations and stuff is what um, led me and Marissa to go further, me, Marissa and Tanya to go further. And it changed it from a game from the numerical integration to actually things that you can manipulate. Manipulating it is not easy, but it can be done. And so if you take your orbits, even for Schwarzschild, so look here, if the case for Schwarzschild is if A is zero, that falls away and that falls away. So you simply have P theta squared is equals to LZ over sine theta. Right, so if you do integrate your Schwarzschild equations, you're going to be integrating P theta, P R, um, as, and um, r and theta as a function of time, you should check that this thing remains constant as well as the Hamiltonian remains constant. Okay, so it's a very nice way of introducing yourself into what these things actually mean simply by playing with Schwarzschild. Okay, but as an exercise, definitely go and verify this thing. It will get you fit with the Poincaré backwards. Definitely go, also compute this guy. 
There's the hard way of simply writing out the Poincaré brackets, or there's a cheat way if you find the relationship between this and K and then use the identities you know of the Poincaré brackets to actually do it. Okay. So this one is definitely zero. Compute what this guy is. You should also find that it is zero. And often they use, people prefer to use this formulation because there are other reasons for using it, but they are both actually the same. Simply, this guy has the advantage that it's always positive, and it's not clear what this guy does. This guy has other advantages. The one I used in the paper with Marissa was that one, Q. So you now know what it means. Okay, so that's the intermediate thing. So you don't even have to fully solve these equations. In other words, integrate these things. You simply have to know that the separation constant exists. And that's already enough to know that you have the new coordinate that remains constant along the trajectory. And as I said, only four space times actually have this property. Only four SAV space times actually have the property that you can do this. Um, and if you want to read about that, I actually prove it in uh, one, of the, one of the papers. I can put the link up to. Um, it's not top priority to read right now, but if that is something that interests you, you're welcome. You have a question? Uh, I am, no, you have a Poincaré map, okay, and you have Poisson brackets, okay, so the Poisson brackets are these guys that are those cross derivatives with respect to um, P and G. The Poincaré map, I'll come to now, it's something that I wanted to actually, for you to plot, okay, the Poincaré map let, let's, I'll go, I'll go, let me go on and then it might become clearer. So the Poincaré map is actually a physical map of your trajectory at a certain thing in time and the brackets are just the definition of those cross derivatives that you do. Okay, so let's now just write out, I've got an extra bracket there, write this thing out a little bit more formally. W is a function of the old coordinates, R, theta, phi and t, and the new momenta which I'm going to call ELZ because we chose them to remain unchanged. Maybe minus over there would work better. Mu, which is the Hamiltonian constant, and K, which is the new constant, that the separation constant. And um, you can write it out with plus omega R plus, th uh, sorry, sorry, WR of R plus WR of theta, and WR, you can simply solve it from those separation equations we got, is simply the integral over R of the square root, okay? All these things are functions of R, not a pretty integral, but it is possible to do it, and that's eff effectively what I eventually do in Marissa's, the functions I play with Marissa's stuff, I actually do this integral. There are ways of dealing with it that I'm really good at. Um, that we can, if that stuff interests you, that's definitely a way you can go. Anyway, you can get an analytic answer over here. Not many people work with it, in fact. And you can get an analytic answer for theta. This integral is actually slightly easier to do, okay? And you can actually then go back and verify that your derivatives work. In other words, the old derivative, the old momentum is just d omega d, um, with respect to the old coordinates, so like r there and theta over here, and then the useful thing is the new coordinates are simply qk, which is the derivative of w with respect to the momenta. In other words, the new momenta is mu and k. Okay, so the new coordinates are messy combinations of having to do this integral first and then take the derivative of the integral with respect to k and the derivative of the integral with respect to mu and the same over here, okay? But it can be obtained, okay? And even before you do the integrals, you can already see the Poincaré map. So don't worry about the integrals for now. There are cool ways of doing this thing that we will get to once you've got the numerics under control and once you've got a lot of these things, these ideas under control. Where it is useful for you is 
with the Poincaré map. And this is why I actually wanted to push to get here so that you can actually check your numerics more easily. Okay, so what the Poincaré map is, is suppose you start with your two momenta, P rho, um, P r, P theta, r and theta. So you've all worked out those equations, I think, for Swatchild. Okay, you can work out their dots and you can integrate them. Okay, and if you integrate them, you're going to get like a time series. And then if you ask the question, let me look at that time series whenever it crosses the equatorial plane. In other words, when theta is equals to pi over 2. Okay, and then what you're going to have happen is... So, oops, suppose I have theta over here and r over here, okay, and theta equals to pi over 2 over here. Okay, so suppose I start there, what's going to happen is I'm going to get some orbit, and then when it's going to go up, it's going to come down. Whenever I cross this point, I record everything. Okay, so instead of keeping the whole orbit, I'm just going to check that the moment theta is close to pi over 2, I keep those dots. Okay, so then I'm going to go down again, I'm going to cross it over there, and then I'm going to get another dot over there. Okay, and so when I cross this orbit, I'm going to draw a graph of P R versus R. Okay. So, say over here, I'm starting with PR equals to zero, because I'm pointing exactly up, so PR is not changing. Okay, so PR is equals to zero, and let's say R over here is equals to seven, just because I want some number. So I'm going to start, I'm going to have one point over there, then I'm going to go on, and I'm going to say, it's, again, I get that theta is equals to pi over two, so whenever I have this list of numbers and when I get to that point, I must find it. When I find it, I go and I plot it on this map. So here R is, say, slightly bigger, okay? But the momentum, it's changing in the R direction, but this momentum is positive, okay? And then I'm going to go back here and I'm going to go at the next point over here. I can see R is still slightly bigger over there the momentum is slightly less, or well, it basically, it comes in here, PR is slightly more vertical, so slightly close to zero, so I'm going to have a dot like that thing over there. So this is our Poincaré map. Okay, so it's a physical map that you make from your trajectories. And then I can go on, and this orbit is going to do a whole bunch of other things. Sorry, I must. Okay, and as it does that, I'm going to get a whole bunch of other points that I always put on this map as I go along. Okay. So what's then going to happen is what I've derived, what this constant actually does, is it gives me what that curve is actually going to be. Okay, so let's, and the way we see this is firstly, we've shown that along a trajectory, k dot remains constant. Okay, that's what you're going to prove. And so... That means that if theta equals to pi over 2, okay, I simply, all the signs become 1 and cos goes away, so I have p rho squared plus Lz minus Ea is equals to k, okay. So I know that every time you're going to have p rho is either going to be plus the square root of k minus this thing, or minus the square root of k minus that thing. So that's something to check, right? You integrate your orbit, you get where it crosses theta, uh, theta, you plot p rho versus r, and you check 
that p theta always is the same, co is a constant, one or two, po either positive or negative. Okay. And, okay, so you're going to have that, and you can check that it actually has the right value. Okay. And then what you also have, so that's a mess that I didn't finish the slides. What you also have is that the same constant k also is, e you can also get PR from it, right? Remember we had an equation for d w dr, okay, and that's just PR, okay? And that also you can simply put, every th put the derivative on the one side and everything else on the other side, and that's also going to be plus minus the square root of this beast, and they're just functions of r. So what you can check is if you make this map of all the dots from integrating the curve, if you plot PR versus that thing for the right constants, then you're actually going to go, and the top square root is going to give you that curve, and the bottom square root is going to give you this one. Okay. Extremely powerful. Not only does it predict it exactly, but it allows you to calculate later on. So this is the thing I actually want you to verify. Okay, and I'm going to stop over there.